All right. Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Stephanie Moy, who is still at NYU Corrent, and she'll tell us about the LP dual Minkowski problem for P between minus one and zero. Uh, the floor is yours. Okay, um, thank you Kasha for introducing me and also for inviting me today to um, give a talk. Um, yeah, so let's get started here. Um, so I'm going to start off by basically introducing a couple of um, important and famous cases of Minkowski type problems. And of course, it makes the most sense to start off with the classical case. So the classical Minkowski problem. Um, so basically, this asks about what type of Borel measures on a unit sphere can be the surface area measure of some convex body. Um, so uh, I guess. This is best explained by a picture. So here are given data, I will say, is concentrated on five unit vectors um, with given data a sub one through a sub five. Um, then if this uh, data has a solution, then uh, we should end up with a five-based polytope, okay? Or if we're in 2D, a polygon. Um, where the face with area a sub i should have corresponding outer unit normal u sub i. Okay, um, so Minkowski was the first to pose this problem. He also solved this a while ago for the polytope case. Um, and then Alexandrov and Fenchel and Jessen came along and uh, they solved it for the general case um, using a variational method. So. Okay, um, the next question I will be talking about is the classical Alexandrov problem. So this was first posed by Alexandrov in 1942. And basically this asks about characterizing the integral curvature measure. So what type of Borel measures on the unit sphere can be an integral curvature measure? Um, and in case some of you are unfamiliar uh, with the definition of this, uh, it's given here. Um, so this integral curvature measure is defined for convex bodies uh, and Borel subsets of the unit sphere. And the integral curvature measure of um, the convex body evaluated at this Borel subset is given by the measure of the radial Gauss image um, of the subset for your convex body K. All right, so... Um, this can also be thought of as the measure of the uh, normal cone of the radial projection to the boundary of your convex body. Okay, well, anyways, this uh, is sort of much simpler for the polytope case. Um, so when we move to polytopes, what this basically amounts to is a discrete measure concentrated on um, the vertices of a polytope with measures, um, with the concentrated measures being given by the exterior angles of the polytope. Okay, so here's a picture. If mu is concentrated on the same five unit vectors as before, with given data alpha sub one through alpha sub five, then uh, if the Alexandra problem has a solution, we should be getting back a five vertice um, polytope, where if we project a unit vector use of i out to the boundary of the convex body, we should end up at a vertex. And the measure of the exterior angle at the vertex should be uh, equal to the corresponding alpha sub i in the data set. Okay, so um, yeah, Alexandrov uh, was the first to solve this problem. So he did it first for polytopes, and then he was able to generalize it to uh, the general convex body case using a sort of topological argument. Um, he also investigated uniqueness of the solution and found that it was unique up to scaling. Okay, and um, the next famous Minkowski problem I'll be discussing is the logarithmic Minkowski problem. So this one is still uh, largely unsolved, I would like to know first. So basically what this question asks is where the necessary and sufficient conditions on a Borel measure on a unit sphere so that it's the cone volume measure of some convex body. 
Um, the cone volume measure is also known as the L0 surface area measure, and it's defined by the following formula. So you can sort of think of it as a the area of a sector uh, with faces um, having outer unit normal uh, being given in the inputs. Okay, so um, in the polytope case, we'll see a picture here. So again, if mu is concentrated on five unit normals, then uh, also with these corresponding data values, uh, we should be getting back a solution that's a five-faced polytope, uh, where the outer unit normal of a given face uh, being u sub i should have cone volume measure v sub i. Okay, so as I mentioned before, this problem is still largely unsolved. Um, there has been progress made on it, though. Uh, for instance, the discrete planar case has been done. Um, also, the uh, even uh, case has been done as well. Okay, so uh, I've just introduced all of these Minkowski problems. Uh, why did I do that? So uh, there is a problem that links all of the problems I just mentioned before, and this is known as the LP dual Minkowski problem. Um, and this is uh, basically why the problem I am solving today is interesting and um, important. Okay, so uh, before I explain this in more detail, we'll have to go through some background on LP from Minkowski theory. So uh, let's start off by defining the LP sum. So in 1962, Byrie was the first to define this sum for P greater than or equal to one and convex bodies K and L. So we have the uh, support function of the LP sum of K and L uh, being given by a function on the support functions of K and L. So yeah, it's exactly like an LP sum. Um, now uh, we'll define the wolf shape for uh, positive function continuous on the unit sphere. And this is given by uh, this formula here. It could also be thought of as the largest convex body that is contained within um, the set that's defined by the support function given by this function here. Okay, so notice that this formula above is defined for P greater than or equal to one. Um, it can be generalized to apply to all P. Uh, this, we can see that when P is less than one has some issues with convexity. So to sort of fix this problem, uh, you can stick a wolf shape operator on the outside to generalize this and guarantee convexity of the LP sum up to convex bodies. Um, yeah, so defined here for P non-zero and slightly differently for P is equal to zero. Okay, so um, LP Brumman Kusky theory uh, became an actively researched field when Erwin Lukwak in 1993 discovered the concept of the LP surface area measure. So, um, similar to how volume is defined, or sorry, surface area measure is defined as a variation on the volume. Um, we can define the LP surface area measure as another variation on the volume, except replacing the regular Minkowski sum on the inside here by the LP sum. So this generalizes uh, the definition of the classical surface area measure. Okay, so yeah, we take a variation on this and on the other side here, we end up with the LP surface area measure um, and also the L0 surface area measure, which is known as the cone volume measure. Um, when p is equal to one, we get back to a classical case. So, um, okay, so um, I guess it's natural now to try to characterize these LP surface area measures. And um, the problem uh, of doing this is known as the LP Minkowski problem. So, to state it fully, we fix a real P, and then we ask where the necessary and sufficient conditions on a Borel measure on the unit sphere so that uh, this Borel measure is the LP surface area measure of some convex body K. All right, so 
Um, some important cases of uh, this problem include the classical Minkowski problem, uh, which is what happens when p is equal to one. Um, when p is equal to zero, the L0 surface area measure is also known as the cone volume measure. So we end up with the log Minkowski problem. And another interesting case is when p is equal to minus n. Um, this is known as the central affine Minkowski problem, and it's very challenging. This is also still uh, widely uh, unsolved. OK, so um, let's talk about what we know about the LP Minkowski problem so far. So uh, when p is equal to 1, the problem has been completely solved. So first by Lutwak and Olliker for the even case, and then by Cho and Wang, uh, they were able to do the general case. Uh, when p is equal to 1, we end up back at the original Minkowski problem, which we've discussed earlier. So I will skip this. Um, and when p is less than 1, things get more complicated and interesting. Um, this is still uh, widely unsolved with the long Minkowski problem and the central affine Minkowski problem being included in this region. Um, but it was investigated by these names here, and I'm sure more that I've forgotten to list. Um, OK. OK, so um, now let's uh, talk about another variants of classical Brahm-Minkowski theory. So this is known as dual Brahm-Minkowski theory. Um, and basically, this uh, dual Brahm-Minkowski theory results from uh, basically asking questions about intersections as opposed to projections. So uh, let's explain this in more detail. Um, an important geometric measure in dual Brahm-Minkowski theory is the m minus q dual queer mass integral of a uh, convex body K. And it's given by this integral here, um, which we can think of as the average of all the Q dimensional intersection areas of uh, your convex body input. Okay, so um, this can be extended to apply to all real Q with a sort of polar uh, integral formula uh, given here some integral on the radial function of k. Um, and one thing to point out is that when q is equal to n, this uh, m minus q dual queer mass integral turns into your classical volume uh, measure. OK, so uh, now it's natural to also try to perform some analysis on this uh, geometric measure. Uh, namely, we're going to differentiate it. Uh, similar to how we did with uh, the LP surface area and the regular surface area measure. So Huang LYZ in 2016 uh, found this variational formula for convex body K. And we differentiate the M minus Q dual queer mass integral of the L0 sum of two convex bodies K and L. Okay, and basically what results on the other side is what's known as the cube dual curvature measure. Um, now, when Q is equal to zero, uh, it's defined slightly differently. Um, so here we're differentiating an entropy functional uh, given here and uh, the L zero, or sorry, the zero dual curvature measure is given on this side. Okay, so um, we might be wondering why dual Brahm-Minkowski theory is uh, sort of dual to Brahm-Minkowski theory. And I think this is most easily seen uh, when looking at the Steiner type formulas resulting from all of this. So basically uh, in the Steiner type formulas, um, the roles of the support function and the radial function are interchanged. Uh, also, the uh, classical Minkowski sum is interchanged with the radial sum, and yeah, so this is where the duality comes in. Okay, so um, again, uh, we'll want to pose the corresponding Minkowski problems for these new geometric measures we just learned about, and 
this problem is known as the dual Minkowski problem. And what it asks is that if we fix a real Q, what are the necessary and sufficient conditions on your given Borel measures so that it's the Q dual curvature measure of some convex body? Um, so some important cases to note. Uh, first, when Q is equal to zero, we end up with a problem that we've discussed before. Um, the L0 dual curvature measure becomes the integral curvature measure. And so uh, we get back to the Alexandrov problem. Um, and when Q is equal to N, uh, the uh, nth dual curvature measure turns into the cone volume measure and we get to the long Minkowski problem. So basically this dual Minkowski problem uh, provides some sort of an interpolation and linking between uh, these two important Minkowski problems here. Okay, so um, let's talk about the progress that's uh, been already completed in this uh, case. So when Q is less than zero, Yiming Zhao uh, provided a complete solution for both existence and uniqueness to this uh, Minkowski problem. Uh, again, when Q is zero, uh, we get to the Alexandra problem, which I've discussed before. And when Q is greater than zero, uh, things are a lot more challenging. Um, again, the long Minkowski problems included in this case. So yeah, so far only progress has been made for uh, given data being even and symmetric um, and uh, mainly um, some necessary and sufficient measure concentration conditions uh, have been found by uh, these names here. Okay. Okay, so um, let's get into the PQ dual curvature measure. So basically, this geometric measure provides a link between all the measures we've discussed before. So it links measures in LP from Minkowski theory to measures in LP dual from Minkowski theory. Um, so here, uh, LYZ in 2019 differentiated the M minus Q dual square mass integral. Um, but instead of taking uh, a variation on the L0 sum, which uh, was done with for just Q dual curvature measures, we're going to be taking it uh, with the LP sum on the inside here. Okay. So um, yeah, so once this is done, on the other side here, we end up with the PQ dual curvature measure. Um, and yeah, so one nice property about the PQ dual curvature measure is that it is absolutely continuous with respect to the Q dual curvature measure we've discussed before. Uh, namely, uh, they're related by a scaling of a power of the support function of K. And um, this has many important cases, uh, all of which we've discussed before. So when P is zero, we end up with the, uh, sorry, Q dual curvature measure. Uh, when Q is equal to N, we get to the LP surface area measure. And when P and Q are both zero, uh, we get back the integral curvature measure of the polar of the convex body. Okay, so again, there is a Minkowski problem associated with this geometric measure known as the LP dual Minkowski problem. Um, so it's written here, where the necessary and sufficient conditions on a broad measure so that it is the PQ dual curvature measure of some convex body. Okay, um, so as we can see from before, the measure unifies the other geometric measures from um, the other uh, Brum and Kusky theories. So we can see here that the corresponding Minkowski problems would be linked. Um, so we are linking the LP Minkowski problem, the Alexandra problem, and the dual Minkowski problem all uh, within this problem here. And uh, in my opinion, that is what makes this problem very interesting to investigate uh, because it provides some sort of an interpolation between all three and can maybe give you a hint on um, you know, some of the unsolved cases.
Okay, so what do we know about the LP dual Mikuski problem? Um, in 2018, Huang and Zhao solved uh, these three cases here. So in this quadrant, P greater than zero, Q less than zero completely. Uh, this quadrant here, the first quadrant, P greater than zero, Q greater than zero for P not equal to Q for symmetric measures. And this uh, third quadrant, this is for even data that vanishes on all great subspheres, so a pretty strong condition. Um, then in 2019, Borowski and Folder uh, were able to completely solve the P greater than one, Q greater than zero case, um, eliminating the uh, or, yeah, the origin symmetry assumption by Huang and Zhao uh, in most of this uh, first quadrant. And in 2021, Chen and Li uh, used PDE techniques to solve completely the P greater than zero case and the P between zero and Q case. Okay. So um, this might be kind of hard to visualize. So I provided a picture here. Um, of exactly what's been done. So uh, Huang and Zhao completely solved uh, this quadrant here. Um, and then they also solved this quadrant here for even measures and P not equal to Q, so missing this line. Um, and Huang and Zhao uh, solved uh, existence for the third quadrant for even measures that vanish on all great subspheres. Um, again, a pretty strong condition. So um, then Borowski and Fodor, they were able to solve everything beyond uh, Q is equal to one. So they solved everything here in this uh, quadrant, provide a complete solution, eliminated the origin symmetry assumption by Huang and Zhao originally. And then um, Chen and Li then provided a complete solution to this entire half plane and also a solution to existence for everything below this line in the third quadrant here. So everything in this triangle. Okay, and a couple of cases, important cases to point out within the LP dual Minkowski problem. Of course, when Q is equal to zero, we end up with the LP Alexandra problem. And also when P is equal to zero, we get the original Alexandra problem, which is exactly at the origin. Um, when P is equal to zero, uh, we get the dual Minkowski problem we've discussed earlier, uh, which for the Q is equal to N case is the long Minkowski problem. So um, yeah, that's given here. Okay, um, and also when Q is equal to N, uh, we end up at the LP Minkowski problem, which is given by this entire axis, uh, sorry, this entire line here. Okay, so um, one observation I'd like to make is that all of these quadrants have had uh, quite a lot of progress with the exception of this quadrant here, um, the fourth quadrant. Uh, yeah, so the results I will be presenting today uh, lie within this quadrant. Okay, so um, yes, let's discuss uh, the main theorem. So uh, here uh, we prove existence for the LP dual Minkowski problem in the case of the given data being symmetric and uh, P being between minus one and zero, Q being less than one plus P and P not equal to Q. Okay, so if we impose these conditions on P and Q, and let our given measure be symmetric, then there exists an origin symmetric convex body such that um, this uh, measure mu is going to be the PQ dual curvature measure of some convex body K. And of course, we have to require that mu is not concentrated on any great subspheres in order to get a close shape at the end. Okay, so. Um, this problem is solved by a variational approach. So uh, yes, basically we first com 
uh, convert the original question into an optimization problem of a functional uh, given here. So we'll be optimizing, or sorry, considering this functional phi PQ uh, defined for convex bodies Q and real P and Q. And uh, it's the product of a support function integral with uh, radial function integral. Okay. And um, yeah, so we have this lemma here, which says that if mu is an even Borel measure on the unit sphere and k satisfies this uh, scaling condition, then the solution to the optimization problem of optimizing phi PQ for uh, origin symmetric convex bodies turns out to be the solution to the LP dual Minkowski problem. Okay. So Huang and Zhao in 2018, uh, basically what they did was they got rid of this assumption here um, in this uh, theorem. And they proved that, with that without that assumption and if P is not equal to Q, um, then there exists an origin symmetric convex body uh, such that, sorry, well, if an origin symmetric convex body optimizes phi PQ, then there exists a, con a constant such that uh, mu is a scaling, uh, yeah, the PQ dual curvature measure of a scaling of the convex body that optimizes the functional. Okay, so uh, why is this P not equal to Q needed? Um, basically what happens here is that when P is not equal to Q, these two terms in the optimization functional have different degrees of homogeneity. So we have an extra degree of freedom, which allows us to scale and get rid of this assumption here. Um, if P were equal to Q, these two would have the same uh, scaling factor, which would eliminate this degree of freedom, which is pretty essential to the proof of this lemma. Okay, so um, yeah. Let's go over the outline of the proof for uh, the existence, the main existence theorem. So as we discussed before, this is a pretty uh, standard variational approach as is normal for uh, solutions to existence of Minkowski problems. So first we convert the question into a maximization problem. Um, from here, we'll have to prove some sort of compactness of the maximizing sequence. Um, and this is so we can guarantee convergence to a compact convex set. Um, so basically how this follows is from an arcella Ascoli type argument. Um, and then once we get convergence to a compact convex set, we don't know yet whether it degenerates or not. Or in other words, we need to prove that it does not collapse to a lower dimension and also that the origin remains in the interior of the limit. Okay. So um, yeah, in the theorem, we're assuming origin symmetry, which means that these previous two points are equivalent. Um, and so if we prove one of them, we'd be done. And uh, this point turns out to be the most difficult part of the proof, mainly because of the estimates that we need to do this. Okay, so um, yes, let's, so first we maximize the phi PQ given before um, this functional, which is a product of a support function term and a radial function term. Um, and notice that this functional uh, is scale invariant, which means that if we have a maximizing sequence and we rescale every term in this sequence, it will make no difference to the value of um, phi PQ evaluated at those convex bodies. Okay, so basically what this means is that we can rescale every term of the maximizing sequence so that they have bounded uh, radius. And uh, therefore by Blasch case Santolo, uh, sorry, Blasch case selection theorem, um, we get existence of the limit, which is uh, the maximizer uh, convex set Q naught. Okay. So uh, now what re remains uh, to show is that Q naught is non-degenerate. 
or in other words, the origin remains in the interior of the limit, Q naught. And to do this, we'll be using a contradiction approach. So uh, we're assuming that Q naught does collapse into something lower dimensional, we'll say k-dimensional. And um, here we'll be considering a thickening, uh, which I call kt. So it's sort of a cylindrical thickening. Um, we're going to be summing q naught with a small scaling of the m minus k-dimensional unit ball um, yeah, in the complementary subspace of the one that q naught spans. OK. So yes, from here, we're going to obtain a contradiction by basically contradicting the supposed optimality of uh, our optimizer Q naught. Okay, so uh, for small t, and we're going to be breaking this step further down into two sub-steps. So uh, yeah, first, we're going to show that this ratio as t approaches zero approaches one. And uh, also we're going to show that the derivative um, at t is equal to zero is going to be greater than zero. So these two combined will be sufficient for contradicting optimality. Okay, so again, um, the main difficulty of this step was uh, the delicate estimates. Um, so here, I basically uh, converted the, uh, yeah, the ratio into the product of two terms. So delta 2 and delta 1. Uh, delta 2 is the ratio of the radial function terms um, between the cylindrical thickening and the uh, supposed optimizer. Uh, and same thing for delta 1, except it's the ratio of the support function terms. Okay. Now, this delta 2 tilde and uh, similarly delta 1 tilde, it's just a functional that's guaranteed to be less than or equal to this original functional above here. OK, so at every t, this is going to be less than this. And um, basically, uh, we choose this cleverly so that this limit of this delta 2 tilde approaches 1, similarly for delta 1 tilde. And then we look at the limit of the differential of these uh, ratios, OK? So um, here, we take the limit as t approaches 0 of the differential of delta 2. And we end up with something that's proportional to t to the minus p minus 1. OK, so again, we're looking at p between minus 1 and 0. So basically what this means is that this term here is going to approach infinity at this rate. Okay, um, and for the delta one case, we look at the differential of delta one tilde at three different cases. So when Q is between zero and one, we end up with uh, this estimate here, proportionally greater than or equal to negative T to the minus Q. Um, when Q is equal to zero, uh, this turns out to be known as the LP Alexandra problem. Um, so this estimate here uh, is what we get for that case. And when Q is less than zero, uh, we end up with just a constant as the estimate of the derivative. Okay, um, so yeah. Combining all of these results together, um, particularly the estimates on the differentials at t is equal to zero, we end up with the overall derivative of the ratio being proportional to t to the minus p minus one and uh, these three cases here. Okay, and we'll notice that when we impose the conditions I mentioned earlier on p and q, that uh, this would mean that the derivative of the ratio at t is equal to zero is going to be positive for small t. Um, yeah, and also, of course, the ratio approaches one um, simply by previous estimates. And therefore, we have enough to contradict the optimality of Q naught. So uh, that completes the proof. Q naught must uh, not degenerate. Okay, so um, there's still 
several open problems uh, for the LP dual Minkowski problem that I think are very interesting to look at. So first uh, is by eliminating the origin symmetry assumption. So this would be very nice to do. Um, in the proof that I presented today, uh, this assumption was pretty essential, uh, namely in the fact that it's equivalent for, uh, for a convex body to collapse and proving that the origin remains in the interior of the limit. So if we were to eliminate this assumption, we'd have to prove these two things separately. And also there would be some difficulties with the current optimization functional that makes things kind of impossible. So perhaps one would have to find a new optimization functional in order to um, complete this. Okay. Um, also the fourth quadrant still has a lot of missing cases after this, uh, namely when P is less than or equal to zero and Q is greater than or equal to one. Um, that would be very nice to look at. Um, the central affine Minkowski problem is included within this region as well as, yeah. Okay, so um, so far all we've been discussing is existence um, to the LP dual Minkowski problem. What about uniqueness? Um, so recently, uh, Xi and Zhang proved a uniqueness result for when P is greater than or equal to Q for the LP dual Minkowski problem in a proceedings paper. Um, what happens when P is less than Q? Well, first of all, the uh, largely unsolved uh, log Minkowski problem is within this region and also its uniqueness, which is equivalent to the log from Minkowski inequality, um, very famous inequality. Um, so yeah, this region would be very nice to consider. Uh, for the LP dual Minkowski problem. Um, maybe we will get another from Minkowski type inequality and um, some more hints as to what happens for the uh, log from Minkowski inequality. Okay, so uh, that's basically it. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, is there the, do you guys have any questions for Stephanie? Yes, uh, Sergey. I know this is just this is just a uh, a thank you. It was, was a great. Can I can ask a question too. Oh, Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering actually about what's the idea behind the choice of this functional phi that you introduced? Yeah. Is so um, basically, what happens is that uh, when you differentiate phi. Uh, if we were at an optimizing point, uh, the differential of this should equal to zero. And um, yeah, after differentiating it, certain things cancel out and you'll end up with uh, basically the solution to the uh, uh, PQ dual Minkowski problem. So it's, it's, in my opinion, it's sort of like a reverse engineering type of thing for choosing these optimization problems. Thank you very much. Yeah. So maybe I can ask you a question. You have this restriction yeah. on P being greater than minus one. Um, this is, yes. do I understand right that this is connected to this, those delicate estimates that only then yes. they yeah. work. So would exactly. you expect for the smaller piece to have to have an entirely different argument? Um, maybe, but also maybe you could improve those estimates uh, to get, yeah, so more no, tighter, no tighter optimal. bounds. You for... didn't like check optimal? No, no there is, no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's optimals I could get <laughs> at the time, right, no. so, sure. yeah. Thank you. No problem. Anybody else? Okay, I don't think we have any more questions. Thank you, Stephanie, for for joining us today and, and telling us uh, a very interesting story of a very long pro of a very big family of problems. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Thanks um, again for inviting me. It was very nice. Our pleasure.